My name is Steve Orsillo, and I am a bondservant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he, he has, and I am working every minute of my day for him. I, what I want the outcome to be is that I successfully make him my father. And if he then calls me son, there's a whole nother set of benefits that come my way. And I, but from my side of the fence, it's I'm his servant. I'm not his volunteer. He doesn't work for me. I work for him. I don't, I don't, he doesn't come join my church. I come, there's only the church that he says, I am building my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'm, I'm, I belong to his church. It's not him bringing his kingdom to me. It's me joining his kingdom. And I, I, I really want, if I have to say it a billion times, and I don't even know if that's even possible for a human to say something a billion times, but if I could say it to try to convince you that we join him, we give our life to him. And so if he's in your life, it's not because you invited him down to walk with you in sin. It's you joined him, and you're walking with him in his kingdom. And his kingdom is here on earth, so you, you're actually walking in his kingdom here on earth. Is that good? Yeah. You, guys, you guys can take that as a kind of like a, that one was for free. This one here is going to cost you everything. All right? And sadly, it's, I'm not even joking, it's just one after the other, boom, boom, boom. And we're still, where we still are is we're leaving the Last Supper, we're on our way to the cross where nothing has changed. The, the Last Supper was on the way to the cross. The, the, who's going to sit at your right hand? It was on the way to the cross. Be the servant of all. It was on the way to the cross. And today... On the way to the cross. And so they're continuing this, and we're in Luke chapter 22, and we're in verse 31. And I, I can somewhat tell you there's, a, there's somewhat of a, a, a wearing out of Jesus' patience with these 12 men. And um, there's, you know, so many things he says, like, how long must I put up with your unbelief? What do I have to do to get you to believe? What do I have to do for you to make you realize I'm with you and for you? You can trust me. It's kind of like this. And I'm so here's it is, verse 31. Simon, Simon, which for those of you that don't know, Simon becomes Peter. So Simon is Peter the apostle. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, P Peter didn't miss this at all because he follows with, but he said to him, Lord, with you, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. He understood. Jesus was saying, when you turn again, when you've come back to me, I'm not going anywhere. No, you don't understand. Satan has to sift you like wheat. It's going to get hard. You don't even know what you're going to do. But I do because I know how feeble your belief is. Wow. It's going to get tough for you, Peter. So verse 34, and he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me. You've denied three times that you know me. And he, Jesus, said to them, the apostles, when I sent you out without money, belt and bag and sandals, I'm sorry, let me read that again. When I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? And they said, no, nothing. And, and Jesus said to them, but now whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. Whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. He who was numbered with transgressors, for that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, look, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, this could be the most confusing verse in the whole Bible. I mean, there's other ones. I mean, there's other ones that are just absolutely crazy. But this one, at least in the New Covenant, is probably the most confusing verse I've ever seen. And I've heard people use it 
to sell the Christian crowd on carrying guns and defending themselves and protecting themselves. And I've heard it used in so many different ways. I've heard it used so that you would have a bag and you would have savings and you would make sure to take care of yourself. So for that to be the case, and I mean, I've heard this many times over 49 years, and it's always been, but for that to be true, everything else has to be not true. He, okay, so this was true until this day, and now from this day on, everybody's supposed to have a gun, you're supposed to have a savings account, you're supposed to make sure you can handle it yourself. That would mean we should all have life insurance, we should all make sure that our tomorrows are taken care of. He must have changed his mind. You understand what I'm saying to you? If, if, if their interpretation of just this one verse, and to pull this one verse out and put it in Christianity, completely changes Christianity. Unless it doesn't mean when you speak in Hebrew and you translate it to Greek, and you take first century philosophy of life, and then you turn it to English, I think you can almost make anything true, can't you? You can make anything, or whatever you want it to be. And turning the other cheek and going the extra mile, and if you're my disciple, you have no, all your possessions belong to me, and if you don't love me more than mother, father, brother, sister, sons, and daughters, you can't be my disciple, and anybody who puts their hand to the plow and turns again is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, it's just so crazy, all the things that have to be not true for the interpretation of this to be that this gives us a right to defend ourselves. This gives us a right to make sure we can take care of ourselves. To make sure we have it stocked up for us and we protect it with our life because that's our provision for tomorrow. And so I went searching. I, I don't do this very often, but I decided to consult many, many um, commentators. And I have some I really like, so I put them off. Like, I don't want to be... I don't want to be married to these guys, right? So I'm going to keep them over here. And I went to all the strangers and all the distant people, all the old, ancient people. And you know what? It's really clear what this means. It makes really sense, good sense. What he's actually saying is what has to be fulfilled is I have to look like I'm amongst a bunch of heathens and ungodly people. And when I sent you out to heal and deliver and preach... Did you lack anything, or did I take care of you? Did the Spirit take care of you? Was there anything you didn't receive? No. You had everything, right? That's right. So now, have these things. And they oh, we got two. See, what they showed was, even though on that day, they had everything, as soon as they got back, they started acquiring the money bags and the belts and, the, and all the things that he said don't take. And they even had two swords. They'd already started falling back into taking care of themselves. They said, we have two. And when it says it's enough, like two swords is going to be enough. No, two swords is going to be enough to prove that you aren't really following me. Two swords is enough to prove that you don't trust in me. Two swords prove that you think the Romans are in control here. Your money bags prove that you think... You have to take care of you. You know, he said, don't even take a coat. Well, we have coats, so we're going to have coats to sell. So you have cloaks to sell. It means you did not listen to me. You have money bags. You did not listen to me. You have swords. You did not listen to me. It's enough to prove, and it's enough to make this prophecy true. He was numbered with the transgressors. They will all say he's numbered with the transgressors because of the way you l did not listen to me but lived on your, chose for yourself what you should do. I find that to be so true in my life for most of those 49 years, a really good portion of those 49 years. I was just as guilty as what they're saying. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter cuts this guy's ear off, right? He cuts his ear off with the sword. Why? Why? There's, six, there's supposedly 600 soldiers there. What are you going to do with a sword, Peter? What is your game plan? Well, most of those same commentators believe that Peter was trying to get Jesus to rise up and save us all from the Romans. You're going to force Jesus' hand to 
rise up and free us because that's what they expected. They've been taught since birth. They've been teaching for hundreds and even a thousand years that the Messiah would come at a time they were under the fist of somebody else, under the heel, and the Messiah would come and deliver us from this enemy. When the enemy he came to deliver us from was unbelief. When the enemy he came to deliver us from was a lack of trust in our Father in heaven. The enemy he came to overthrow was sinfulness in our lives. And what they were looking for, what they decided, Judas as well, who sold him out, I'll sell him out and then they'll, then he'll have to rise up. They're going to kill him if he doesn't rise up. I believe he's the Messiah and he's just sitting here praying for people. He's la- talking about forgiveness. He's talking about the Holy Spirit coming and living in us. He's talking about all this stuff. Telling us to turn the cheek and put up with tyranny. And when they ask us to take, carry their sword, carry it twice as far. Prove you're better than them. Do good to those who persecute you. Do good to those who do evil to you. Like what? Then what do I need a sword for? It's obvious. This verse, everything else in the Bible would have to be untrue. What it says is, since you don't trust me, it's perfect. You're going to fulfill the verse that says, I'm going to be numbered against transgressors because you're a bunch of transgressors. Peter, when you've turned, believe in me. When you've come back, it's going to be okay. Satan's asked to sift you like wheat. But when you've turned, I'm not going nowhere. Peter, man, by morning, by morning you're gone, buddy. Like Jesus doesn't know what's going on. Like, that's not true. But when the, co- when the rooster crowed, Peter was cut to the quick. He was crucified to the soul. Like, oh gosh, it is true. I am a transgressor. I want to point out something to you that is my favorite, could be my favorite verse in the Bible, because I'm so much like Peter that, like, I mean, I identify with Peter. I do. The guy who walked on water and the guy who sunk, the guy who screwed up every time, got told, get behind me, Satan, and all those things. I mean, I'm so much like Peter, it's ridiculous. And so that's why this verse I'm going to tell you about is one of my favorites. Could be my favorite. The ladies are meeting Jesus after the resurrection. The tomb is empty. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? That whole thing. And in the book of Mark, which was... What's the word? Uh, When you tell somebody and they write it down. Transcribed by Mark. John Mark wrote the book of Mark with Peter telling him what to do. He, He spoke it. And so it's called Mark, right? And Peter... And, and, the guy, and Peter's the only one to include this in his gospel of Mark. He said, quickly now, go tell my disciples and Peter. Yeah. It's like, I just, got, I just got goosebumps saying it again. Because you know what he really said was, go tell my disciples. And that Steve Orsillo in the 21st century, in the 20th century, the 20, that Steve Orsillo that's about to come, make sure you tell him too. That I have risen from the dead. That's such good news. I've risen from the dead. I've conquered this sin nature you have about carrying swords and providing for yourself and not trusting me. And even though you've experienced, when I, when I sent you out and told you to do all this, did you lack for anything? Nothing. That's right. So why did you go back on it? Why didn't you trust him? I can't tell you how many times at the altar... People who've run off from here and destroyed their lives at the altar. And I beg them, come back to us. I can't. Why? I can't. When was your life the best it ever was? When I walked alongside you. Come back then. The door's wide open. Come back. You know how to have what Jesus is giving. Come back and walk with me. I can't. Not too long ago, one of them died. It just broke my heart. How come you, how come you couldn't? How come you couldn't re- reacquire your faith in Jesus that you had when your life was the best it's ever been? How come you can't? Is it because we don't live it? Is it because we carry the money belts and the swords? 
Is it because we do exactly what you told us not to do? Because that's what the whole story is. He's, he's left. He took them up there to show them what's to come. You're going to have, you're going to see my body broken for you. You're going to see my blood shed for you. Eat of my body and drink of my blood. Remember me, for this is the covenant, my new covenant with you. So events are going to unfold, and you're going to have to remember me and what I said to you. He had already told them a wise man built his house on rock, and that man is the one that hears what I said and does it. A foolish man builds his house on sand, and that's the man who hears these words and doesn't do them. If any of you would come after me, you would deny self. Deny self. Pick up your cross and follow me carrying yours for the world, just like I carry mine for the world. Giving, laying your life down for others, just like I lay my life down for others. Inasmuch as you do this for the least of these, You've done it for me, and you'll be called sheep, and you'll enter into my reward, eternal life. Right there in Matthew 25. Inasmuch as you didn't do this to me, and both crowds said, when was that? When you didn't take my words and put them into action. You follow me? You tracking what I'm laying down? And it's just Jesus going, what? I mean... My one question, my one statement. We have two swords, yeah, but you weren't supposed to have any. The fact that you have two means you didn't listen to me. We have all that we, we need. We got what we need. Yeah, you've got what you need so that I look like I'm numbered amongst the transgressors. And I know that's the way it's supposed to be, so it's good enough. They'll all look at me as a transgressor. That'll get me crucified, like I'm leading a rebellion against Caesar. You're, you're effectively getting me committed, uh, what's the word at the end? Of the, guilty. Yeah, not acquitted, but convicted. convicted. Thank you. Convicted. Mm-mm-mm. Maybe, maybe. Words, move, move words. All right, you with me? <laughs> Look here, it's enough. I just, it's, it's so common to talk about, you know, Peter, you'll deny me, and Peter saying, I'm ready to go to death with you. I'm ready to do it all for you. Okay, give all that you have to the poor. I'm not ready. The, I can't do that. <laughs> good teacher, good teacher. How can I have eternal life? Why are you calling me good? Do you really believe I'm good? Okay, so I am good. It's right to call me good because only Heavenly Father is good. And you're re- are you recognizing I'm Him? You understand how sometimes we totally misunderstand these verses? Are you recognizing I'm Him? You're not supposed to call anyone good, but you're calling me good. Is that because you see me? He says, how, how can I have eternal life? Oh, do this. Oh, I can't do that. He says to that guy, that guy asks, what's the greatest commandments in the law? And he answers him, the ones in the law are that, which haven't helped you at all, by the way. And Christianity Today, if I were to ask the question, 150%, which isn't even possible, but 100% of people answer the same thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We'd rather take... What everyone else says is true instead of what Jesus says is true. Jesus never said that's the command, his commandment. He said, my commandment is a new commandment I give to you. The new commandment of the new covenant is that you love one another as I have loved you. Which is to Jesus didn't carry a sword or a money belt. He didn't carry anything to take care of himself. In fact, he said to the apostles one time, they were talking about eating He says, will you give them something to eat? We don't have anything. Should we go to the store? He goes, weren't you there with the 5,000? 
And weren't you there with the 7,000? I had two fish and five loaves to work with. Weren't you there? Can't you believe in me? Can't you see who I am? Okay, go, go buy food if you want. You know, go do what you want. No, believe in me. You saw it with your own eyes. Weren't you there when I healed the lame? Weren't you there when I made the blind see? When the leper was cleansed? Don't you know who I am? And it's just like the young ruler. Good teacher. Why are you calling me good? Give me an answer. Let's see if you know the answer. Are you really believing I'm the heavenly father? Are you really believing I'm with him? Philip says, show us the father. He says, Philip, you've been with me this long. And you're asking to see the Father? See, these guys got it later because in their letters they said, this is how the Father loves us. He sent Jesus. Someone says, what is the love of the Father? It says it three times. For this is the love of the Father, that he sent Jesus to die on a cross. This is the love of the Father. This miserable experience of carrying, being beaten all night, crowns of thorns, carrying a cross, nailed to that cross, this is the love of the Father. No. Being born in a manger, living on earth, and teaching us everything we need. That's, and then dying for our penalty, serving the penalty of our sins. It's all of it. Conquering death with the resurrection. It's the whole story. This is the love of the Father. This is how He loves us. And this also, the third time, this is how we know he loves us, the story of Jesus. These guys walked the story of Jesus, and he says, so go buy a sword. <laughs> oh, we got some. It's enough to fulfill the prophecy. See, if you just don't keep that fulfill the prophecy in there, it could mean anything. You can make it mean anything you want. But the problem is, what he's saying it's enough of, it's enough to fulfill that prophecy that I will be counted amongst the transgressors, because you have swords. It, because you worry so much about yourself. You look out for you. Did you not hear me say, if you want to be with me, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me? Did you not see? Listen to this. A legion is roughly, most times, and especially the first century, a legion is 6,000 soldiers. So when the ninth legion goes to fight Germania, and there's only one legion, that's 6,000 guys. If two legions go, the ninth and the 12th, that's 12,000. Everybody knows who's gone to fight. It's this, you know, the Eagle Legion or this legion, whatever the legions are named. So Jesus, the Bible says, has 12 legions of angels. And if he's using the same counting of 6,000 uh, soldiers, then that is 72,000 angels, invisible warriors coming to defend him against a measly garrison of Roman soldiers who want to crucify him. Talk about having a sword. Talk about having a gun. Talking about defending yourself. He's ready. But he did not utter a word. When they were pounding the nails, he didn't say, okay, enough. Come get him. When he was praying, he said, is there any other, is there any other way to save Steve Orsello or Josh Hardesty? Is there any way to save Larry Courtney? Because that right arm that got nailed, it's hurting. Before they can put that left arm to the nail, could you guys save me? Because we're going to have to find another way to save those guys. No, he did not say a word. Put your name in there. Put your name on that list. Is there any other way to save you? Yeah, go ahead and hit the nail. And I got 12,000, I got a gun bigger than all. Uh, my, it's, it's like sometimes us men daydream about going back to these battle, sword battles, but we have a, we have a Thompson, you know, the, the big roll of yeah. 4,000 rounds, you know. We would survive. I mean, any of you guys ever daydreamed about going back in time with a gun? Like you're invincible, you know? 
You know, no, no, there's a lot. You know, they, I, I promise you, I promise you, that's a, that's a common daydream of a child, a boy child. I got, the, I got a gun and you got a, you got a bow and arrow. So, it's like he has the gun and everybody else is, you know, throwing stones. But he didn't call on his gun. His gun was 72,000 angels, maybe. Maybe. But he did not defend. He didn't carry a sword. And he wasn't telling them to buy swords. He was telling them, if you're not going to be with me, you're going to need a sword. If you're not going to believe in me, you're going to need a money belt. You really are. You're going to need a savings account, and it's going to have to be full. And you know that little shed you have behind your house? It's going to have to be full of some canned goods, too, because if you don't have me, you're going to have to take care of you. But if you have me, weren't you okay when you had me? Weren't you okay when you trusted in me? Christian teaching across the board today is all about the responsibilities of jobs and money and bills and bond and daring and burn and taking care of your leaving, uh, leaving inheritances for your grandchildren, all this crazy stuff. Best place to sell life insurance? The Christian church. Best place to sell annuities? The Christian church. Because we live in a somewhat of a fear of hell and heaven and all that. The, our own belief, the fact that we believe God that there is an eternal life makes it so we need to take care. I'm going to make sure. Um, the chances are I'm going first before my wife. That's the chances. I mean, anything can happen. But those are the chances. Is she well taken care of? Well, I love her so much. I mean, I love, I've loved her for so long and given my life so much for them, the, the whole family. There's such a pressure, you know. There's such a pressure. I better buy a sword. I better get my money belt and fill it up and hide it under a bush. Still, you know, find a nice hiding spot. And in our case, it's savings accounts and annuities and life insurance. And, and, and yet in the Christian church, when the economies fall, offerings go down. When the truth of Jesus' teaching is, when economies fall, offerings should go up. There'll be more needy people. We should bring more into the priesthood to give out. It's what they always go down. I think we, more, more than ever, identify more with the apostles pre-resurrection than we do the apostles post-resurrection. See, post-resurrection, they didn't take swords or money belts. They didn't take extra. They themselves fed the crowds with the two fish and five. They got it. And if the Holy Spirit comes upon me, what the whole goal is, is that I learn to have him as a father. Last we talked about, last week, we talked about being the youngest. He said, you must be like the youngest. Told you that me and her are the youngest in our families. I really have a pretty good view of the youngest. About holding my mom's hand. I'm safe holding her hand. That's what you have to be as a Christian. You're safe because you hold his hand. You're safe because his presence is inside of you. You're, 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 your life and death is not in their hands, it's in his hands. No weapon formed against me is something we quote all the time. We've got bumper stickers, no weapons. We put it all over Facebook, no weapon formed against me. We, we love this verse, no weapon formed against me. I, I know the plans I have for you. We love these verses. But what Jesus is saying, you love the verses, but you don't believe them. And that's what he's telling his apostles. As he goes to die, they will scatter. Peter will deny. And then he will say to the angels, go get them. Go find them. Tell them I'm back. They'll be glad to hear it. Tell them to meet me in this room. And in that room, he began to give them the power that they needed to believe in him. And they were transformed. Now, if you feel like you identify more with the apostles prior to the resurrection then you should probably come forward and repent. You should probably bow your knee at this altar and beg for forgiveness and make some kind of a decision. I want to trust you the way you said they should trust you. 
Not in this verse. This verse is just pointing out that they have fallen short of his teaching. That they have gone back from what he showed them. I showed you that you're okay with none of this stuff, but you've gone back and acquired this stuff because you're a little worried about not having it. You don't understand who I am. You think you have to rise up in a war against the Romans like you're like Gideon and Samson and all these guys rose up in wars. God rose them up. That was his plan for them. But it's not your, the plan for Jesus' followers. New covenant people, just hold his hand. I used to go, I mean, I was the scaredest child you ever met. I was afraid of everything on earth. And my mom would hold my hand and I knew I was okay. Because I was the youngest. I'd watch my brothers at the blowhole in Honolulu. They'd, my brothers would go out surfing in Waikiki and I was afraid to go past my knees. But if I held my mom's hand, I could go all the way waist deep. I could swim in the ocean. Everything that ever happened, I would hold my mom's hand and I'd be all right. See, that's the picture. The future looks bleak, man. It looks... There's so much garbage going on that's scary. There's anti-Christian sentiment everywhere. Our, our church in Pakistan is hated dramatically because Israel's fighting Hamas. A, few year, a year before that, some guy in Switzerland, Sweden, Sweden, burned a Koran. Many of them were killed, burned out, fired from their jobs, evicted from their homes. They're already living it. But what I see in them is because of their persecution, they're holding their father's hand. They're believing. They're continuing to give their food away. We still send the money, and they buy with that money, they buy food and give it away. Do you follow me? Because they're holding their father's hand. And I'm telling you, if you identify more with the apostles before the resurrection and how bad they fail here in these stories scattering, denying, running, afraid for their lives. And then later, every single one of them was martyred. They were killed for their faith. Which do you identify with? I will pick up my cross, deny myself, and follow you. Because Jesus said, no one comes after me unless they're willing to do that. No one can be my disciple. Man. I have identified with those guys. As a Christian, I have identified with those guys. I was just like them, but I'm not like them anymore. I refuse to buy into the world system. If you identify with those guys before the resurrection, then you you desperately need to repent, come to an altar. I'm saying, close your eyes, bow your heads, pray, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Close your eyes and bow your heads. Please, everybody. All of you, close your eyes and bow your heads. By doing that, you're, I, you are joining together as a crowd. You are joining together with, if, you're, if you are safe in this sermon, you're identifying with those that aren't. And like the uh, prophets of old, we repent as though it was our sin. And I say, I'm, I have sinned and fallen short for my community does not trust in Jesus but, but needs to have needs to protect itself and provide for itself, cannot trust Jesus. I don't know how you trust Jesus for your sins if you can't trust him for your provision. I just don't know how that's possible. And I'm worried that it isn't because many of us will be surprised there at the judgment seat of Christ. And so I beg you, I implore you, I call out to you. Surrender your will and say, Lord, where do I stand with you? Am I one of those hiding a sword, hiding a money belt? Do I need to repent? And if you just close your eyes and bow your head and take this one moment to hear the Lord speak to you a yes or a no, do I need to repent? Now hear the answer. Do I need to repent? Do I need to change my life? Now, if you heard the word yes, I want you to hear the answer. Lord, will you help me? Yes or no? Lord, will you help me change? 
I don't know, Lord, if I can, but I, will you help me change? Now hear his voice. And I'm telling you, if you heard the, do I need to repent? You heard a yes. Don't walk out of this room. There's ministers in this room who will pray with you, but the Holy Spirit is here to minister to you. And I'm going to ask you to just get up and come forward. If you heard the word yes, do I need to repent? Yes. Then you need to get up. Do you still, do you still carry that sword to protect yourself? Do you still, do you still f- wear that money belt to take care of yourself? Are you hoarding food because you don't think God can? Do you need to repent? Are you having a hard time trusting your father, putting your hand in his hand when you're deathly afraid and saddling up anyway because you got him by the hand? He's got you. Then come and kneel and repent. Trust in the Lord and repent. That really, to be honest, people, this this front should not even have room for all the people, I'm telling you. If you heard the word, yes, I cannot trust in the Lord, I need to repent, then you need to come and repent. Keep coming. Keep. Would you keep your eyes closed? Even at, when you get settled in the front, would you close them again? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. And he will make straight the paths before your feet. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Everyone who came forward, people in your seats who know you should have come forward, pray anyway. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Say it out loud. Jesus, forgive me for trusting in the world system, for trusting in the swords that I can own, for my own mighty right arm to save me. Lord, forgive me for trusting in the world's system of provision, trusting in savings accounts, in equities, and not trusting in you. Forgive my fear, Lord, that that the enemy would sift me like wheat. Forgive my fear, Lord. Come on, say it out loud. That the enemy would sift me like wheat. And that I would fall short. And that I would prove to the world that you're not real by my beliefs by my actions forgive me Jesus I receive your forgiveness and the Lord is placing his hand on you and this is the word of the Lord I forgive you I forgive you As the pastor of the Father's house, for every one of you who said that with a sincere heart, your sins are forgiven you. Be set free. Be set free. Be made whole. Hallelujah. The King is here. And he is my Father who art in heaven. His name is hallowed and honored and and given all the glory in my house and this house. (laughs) His kingdom has come. His will is done here just as it is there. 
be strengthened by this fact. His kingdom has come. His will is done here, just as it is there. And he gives us our daily bread, and we can trust him. For what man among you, if his son asked for bread, would give him a scorpion or a rock? What man among you? And if the Holy Father is asked, would he give you emptiness? How much more would your Heavenly Father give you the good things you asked for? He is not leading you into temptation. He is delivering you from the evil one. In him is the power and the glory and the honor forever and ever. And if you will grab him by the hand, you will need no swords. You will need no assurances. You will need no annuities. You will have him and he is your assurance and he is your salvation at the name of Jesus every knee will bow every tongue confess that he is Lord the king is here he is Jesus the Christ the son of the living God and if you've seen him you've seen the father for he and the father are one I will trust in him for here we go to the cross and I'm somewhat ashamed that he had to go to the cross to save me but rest assured he did my sins were on him my sins were on him he became sin so that I could be made holy he became sin so that you could be made holy. And we will glorify the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. The King is here. And he has come to touch you and fill you up. Now just become very aware of his presence around you. Feel it with all your heart. Feel it. Just pause. I will, si I will go silent for a moment. Pause and feel his presence around you. Thank you for watching the Father's House Oroville YouTube channel, but don't stop there. Please subscribe to our channel and help us spread the message of Jesus to all your friends and family by sharing our videos. You can also help support us financially by clicking the Give button. Thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you again soon.